If we haven't met before, my name's Adam. I'm the pastor here, and we're privileged it is to have you here this morning. Um, if you would, right after service today, go over right here to the next steps. We'd love to get some stuff in your hand and just get to know you. But we are in a series entitled Revival Ready. Who's ready for revival in this place? I'm ready for a move of God. And so we said this, that the, and in this series, the Lord is teaching us to birth, to build, and to sustain a move of God. That's what we're after. We're after a move of God, not, not an emotional feeling, not something to where we feel blessed, but we're after a move of God that changes this region and changes the city for his glory and not our own. Amen? And so uh, last week we talked about that we feel like the Lord, I know the Lord, has called us in this house to become a literal house of prayer. In Mark 11, Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And he ended this statement by saying, it's for all nations. So not only will we be in a house of prayer just for us to to experience the move of God, but it's for us to freely we receive, now freely we're going to give. We received the move of God, now we're going to give it away to this world. Amen? So we do that through prayer. But here's the thing, as we, as we pray and as we become this house of prayer, as we go after a move of God in this place, revival will never come in a comfortable way. It's not going to make us comfortable. We can't put the Holy Spirit in a box. It's going to, it's going to have a price tag attached to a move of God. Really think about that for a moment. There's a price tag of holiness and consecration that comes with the move of God. There's no way we're going to have a move of God without that. But we have to become a house of prayer. But we've said here, we here at Journey, we're willing to pay the price. Yeah? We're not going to be neutral. We're not going to be lukewarm Christians. But we're going to be people who are on fire for the Lord, who are going after the Lord in him only, not after a feeling, not after just going through religion, not after making a check box here on Sunday. But we're going to live the gospel and see the Lord do something here now in our generation, even outside of these four walls. Because we have freely we received, now free we're going to give. We're going to give it away to a lost and a hurting world. So this week, I feel like this is almost like part two from last week. We're going to talk about how we partner, how prayer partners with Scripture to walk in our spiritual authority that God has placed upon our lives. We're going to learn to walk in the spiritual authority that God has given us. I want to look at uh, Moses and the story here in Exodus chapter 4. This is going to be our text this morning, our our main text where we're going to kind of build everything upon. Uh, Let's read this together. It says this, Exodus 4, 1 through 5. Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. This is after Moses had an encounter with God at the burning bush. And he's called to go deliver the people of Israel. But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Moses is dealing with doubt. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground. It became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. Pick up your staff. And he reached out his hand, caught it, and it became a rod in his hand again. Verse 5. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. I've entitled my message this morning, and this is what I believe this year is going to be. I've entitled my message, The Year of Authority. This year is going to be a year where the people of Journey... We as a people begin to walk in the spiritual authority and the mandate that God has placed upon us as individuals. It's going to be the year of authority. Let's pray together. Lord, no one came here this morning to hear from me. Lord, we all came here to hear from you. 
Lord, we praise you, God, for what you are doing, Lord. We pray you for the miracles that, God, you have already done. And, Lord, I know that, God, there is going to be more in the future, Jesus. As we partner, God, with your word and we begin to walk in the spirit, Lord, just as your disciples pray, Lord, teach us how to pray. God, I pray that, Lord, you would teach us how to pray, Jesus, that this house would literally become a house of prayer, God. Lord, you demanded your house become a house of prayer. And so, God, as we walk this out, Jesus, as we boldly declare your word, your scripture, God, I pray that, God, we would see you move in a mighty way. God, that your people would no longer be neutral, Jesus. You would no lo- we would no longer be satisfied with the things of this world world, God, but we would be a people so on fire and so passionate for you, Jesus. We would begin to walk in our spiritual authority. So, Father, I pray that today, God, you would speak to us this morning. Speak to us this morning for your servants are listening. We love you and we thank you. And everyone said amen, amen. When I was young, I... uh, Spent a lot of time with my grandmother. My mom passed away when I was a five, and so my grandmother and my grandpa moved into the neighborhood to take care of my sister and I. Um, and I stayed with her a whole lot because my dad went on business trips and he was away, went there after school and everything as well. And my grandmother was one of those Christians that just, she believed what the Word of God said, and she walked it out in her life. She'd walk around the house singing worship songs. She walked around the house quoting scripture. And I remember she would even go to another length when I was uh, in the summertime when I'd be staying with her. She would have me read the word, have me read the Bible, like literally as a, as a young 10, 11, 12 year old, I'd read the Bible for three hours in the summertime. And I hated every minute of it, y'all. But she was one of those types of radical Christians. She was like, Adam, I don't care. This is going to be good for you. And I tell you what, it was good for me. I'm really thankful for it. But at the time, I did not like it at all. It was not fun. But I remember walking downstairs early in the morning, often when I stayed with her, and I would hear her in her prayer closet praying. And she would be quoting and praying scriptures over my family, over my grandpa. My grandpa wasn't saved at the time, and he actually became, uh, was led to the Lord the last week of his life, praise God. But I remember her, she was fervent in prayer. She was steadfast in prayer. And she would pray scriptures on a regular basis. That's how she learned how to pray, through praying scripture. She was a person of revival. She carried a mandate of revival on her life, and she walked it out. Uh, I remember people at church growing up, they would say to me, man, your grandma, there's just something different about her. She just loves the Lord so much, and when I'm around her, I just sense the presence of God. You see, she carried the tangible presence of God because she was with the Lord in her quiet time. We don't really see the word revival in scriptures, but we see uh, the word revive and awakening. And David prays this prayer, revive me according to nine different times in Psalms 119. He prays, revive me according to nine different times in Psalm 119. It's the longest psalm that we, that we find in the Bible. I want to read these revive me according to statements that David has. Verse 25 in Psalm 119, it says, my soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your what? To your word. Revive me according to your word. Verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. Verse 40, behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. Verse 88, revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep the testimony of your mouth. Verse 107, I'm afflicted very much. Revive me, O Lord, according to your what? According to your word. Verse 149. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness, O Lord. Revive me according to your justice. Psalm 154. Or uh, 119, 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your what? To your word. uh, Verse 156. Greater you, your tender mercies, O Lord. Revive me according to your judgments. Verse 159, consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. 
out of nine times that David writes, revive me, these revive me statements, this plea, this desire in his heart to walk in personal revival, this, this longing in his heart to walk in this awakening with the Lord. Out of the nine times, one third of them or three different times, he says, revive me according to your word. Revive me, Lord, according to your word. David knew that if he was going to have this personal revival, he had to walk out what the word of God said. But not only that, he had to know the word of God. He was asking the Lord to watch him. And Lord, may I walk in, in, in you according to your word. Revive me, Lord, according to your word. If we don't learn to love the word of God, I'm telling you, church, we will never see revival. We will never see revival if we don't learn to love the word of God. And here's the thing about this. Our prayers will be empty if we are not praying according to what the word of God says. If we don't understand and know the context of what the Lord is saying at a particular moment and learn to press into what the word says, then we are praying empty prayers because we're not praying according to the word. Lord, revive me according to your word. And so as we learn to pray, Lord, teach me how to pray, the disciples ask. As we learn how to pray, and we ask the Lord, Lord, revive me according to your word, and we begin to pray with authority that God has given us through his word, then we're going to see something happen in this place where we are going to experience revival. It is going to happen. And here's the thing, as we begin to step out, as we begin to live this out, as we begin to walk according to the word of God, as we begin to uh, press into this mandate that God has placed on our life to birth, to build, and sustain a move of God through going after his word, I have to let you know this, though. The enemy is going to do everything he possibly can to come against you. He will do everything he possibly can to take you out. If he recognizes and knows and sees a people who are going after the Lord with all that they have and they're learning to pray and pray scripture, the enemy will throw every fiery dart that comes against you that he possibly can to take you out. And here's the thing though. If we become people who learn how to pray the word of God, every single time we will defeat the enemy. We wouldn't even know that he's throwing fiery darts at us because they won't even reach us because we are praying according to the word of God. Think about this. When Jesus went into the desert, into the wilderness, and he was tempted by the enemy, he was fasting for 40 days. The enemy was, was, was tempting him. How did Jesus, the son of God, Defeat the enemy according to the word of God. We have to understand the word of God. Hey, the Satan said to, to Jesus, listen, I know you're really hungry right now. I'm paraphrasing. See this rock? Turn it to bread. What does Jesus say? He quotes scripture out of him. Man does not live by bread alone, but out of every word that comes from the mouth of God, right? So we are quoting scripture. Hey, 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 Jesus, just worship me and I'll give you everything else, Satan said to him. What does he do? He defeats him with scripture. We have to learn to defeat the enemy through scripture, how to pray scripture. And so we're going to learn how to do that. Lord, revive me according to your word, this desire inside of David's heart. Now back to Moses and talking about this. So now when God called Moses to go back to be the deliverer of Egypt, God appeared to him in his burning bush. And Moses, he throws down his staff because God tells him to. What does his staff do? It turns to a snake, which we just read earlier. What does Moses then do? He runs away from the staff because it turns to a snake. I don't know about you, but I'd probably run away too. I'd be a little bit scared as well. I am deathly afraid of snakes. I don't, I don't do snakes. Like if they're around, if I see one, I'm going the opposite way. I, I don't want anything to do with snakes. I've, I've hiked on a trail before with my family, and then all of a sudden I've come across a snake slithering across the pass up in, up in North Carolina, and the next thing I know, I'm running the other way, y'all. I'm, I'm screaming like a little girl. I've been, I've been weed-eating in my yard, and I feel like there's snakes everywhere. I've said this before, but man, I'm, I'm looking out for them. If I see a snake, I'm dropping that weed-eater, and I'm running the other way. I'm, I'm running like Moses from the snake. 
But then God tells him, hey, pick up the snake by the tail. (laughs) But we all know that you don't pick up snakes for one thing, but you certainly don't pick up a snake by the tail. What do you do? You pick up the snake by the the head if you're going to pick it up. And Moses, I imagine he's really, he's trembling at that moment. He's really scared. And so what does he do? He says, okay, God, I'm just going to trust you in this. I don't know about this. I'm picking the snake by the tail. He picks the snake by the tail. What does it do? It turns back to the rod. And God tells him, this rod is everything you're going to need to deliver the people of Israel from the Egyptian hold. What does he do? He uses the rod to part the Red Sea. He extends the rod to part the Red Sea. And then when Israel crosses safely, what does he do? He extends the rod again and washes all the Egyptians away. He gets water from the rock with the rod. He defeats the Amalekites as he lifts up his hands with the rod in his hands. In different places it says, it's the staff of God. May I submit to you this morning that we all have a rod and our rod to defeat the enemy is the word of God. Our rod to defeat the enemy with everything that might come against us is the word of God. So this morning, I want to give you three things this morning about the word of God that we can know when we are praying that is powerful. So number one this morning, I want to give you Three things about the rod that is the word. Our our rod is the word of God. Number one, we must realize the power of God's word. We must realize the power of God's word. And and y'all, we've all heard this before. The word of God is powerful, but do we really understand it in our hearts? We must understand the power of God's word. Psalm 33, 6, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. The Hebrew word for breath here is the word ruah. Ruah means spirit. You see, all creation took place through the word of God and the spirit of God. Everything that exists, has existed, or ever will exist, owes its existence because of two forces, the word and the spirit of God working together. The word must work with the spirit and the spirit with the word. Think about this. You cannot speak without releasing breath, can you? You have to breathe to speak. Listen, every time God speaks, his breath, his spirit is released. God's breath is the spirit that releases the word. The spirit and the word go together. When we speak the word of God with the spirit of God, we are exercising our God-given spiritual authority in our life. When we partner with God's word, it's powerful. When we pray God's word, it's powerful. When we worship using scripture, it's powerful. I love worshiping using scripture because when we're worshiping and it's in a scripture base, what happens is we as a congregation, I don't know if you really understand it, but we are singing scripture all at the same time and is declaring the power in the word of God and there's power in that, amen? Isaiah 55, 10 through 11 says this, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. Verse 11, so shall my word, say my word. Come on, a little louder now. I know you shouted at the Jags game last night as they were winning. So shall my what? My word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return void. His word out of his mouth will not return void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Notice God says, my word out of my mouth. The word without the spirit does not accomplish much. The spirit without the word does not accomplish much. When when we marry, when we combine, and when we bring in unity, the spirit of God that lives within us, we begin to declare the word of God. It is powerful, and it accomplishes much. The word and the spirit must marry. They must operate together. When they do, we can have confidence that God will move. So point number two this morning I want to give you, we can be confident in God's word. 
We can be confident in God's word. Why can we be confident? Because the word of God is a weapon. We can be confident because the word of God is a weapon. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We must be confident to release the word of God in any situation that we may be facing. We cannot be timid. We must be bold. You have to make up your mind that God's word is true. What he says is, is fact. And who he says that I am is who I actually am. And I can do what the word of God says I can do. You have to make up your mind that it's true. Moses was afraid of his rod. He threw it on the ground and then he ran from it because it turned into a snake. Let me submit to you before we can be effective in declaring the word of God and proclaiming it, we have to be afraid of the word of God. We have to have a reverence towards the word of God. Isaiah says this. Let me show you this in scripture. Isaiah 66, 1 through 2 says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Just think about how big God is right there. <laughs> Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all, th- for all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. In other words, he says, you can't build me a temple or a building big enough because heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. But he says this, but on this one will I look. One translation, on this one I will bring favor. Another translation says, on this one I will bring respect. So who does God bring favor upon? Who does God look upon? Who does God bring respect towards? On him who is poor and contrite in spirit. And what? And who trembles at my, what? My word. He who is poor and contrite in spirit. See, there's this humility, this reverence before the Lord, this posturing our heart before God of being contrite and humble in spirit and then trembling at the word of God. The very thing that you should be opening on a daily basis, the very thing you should tremble at, You see, our first reaction to the word of God has to be fear and awe. You know what I'm guilty of often? I'm guilty of just being so familiar with the word. I'm guilty of just not looking at it in this reverence and this awe that we should be looking at it. I'm guilty of just knowing what it says without really allowing it to penetrate and to renew my mind and my heart. We have to be people who fear the word of God. Watch this. This is why. John 12, 47 through 48. And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, Jesus says this. Jesus says, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the word, but to save the world. Or judge the world, but to save the world. Verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last days. So Jesus says, I'm not going to be your judge. You're going to be judged by the word of God. Imagine one day when we stand before the Lord and we will be judged, but we'll be judged according to what? According to the word. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm a believer. I'm not going to be judged. I'm under under grace. There's two different judgments. There's the believer's judgment, and there's the unbeliever's judgment. We've said this, that belief determines where you'll spend eternity, but our behavior determines how you'll spend eternity. We have a whole message on it uh, last year. 
that what you do in this earth, it really does matter. You'll be judged in heaven based upon what you do. You'll be judged in hell based upon what you do. You see, we are under grace, but we have to do so much more than just get saved and get to heaven. Because what we do really does matter. And so when we stand before Jesus, if we are blood-bought under the cross, I'm so thankful for Jesus and his cross and his grace and mercy upon my life that I can come, that I'm, I'm going to be in heaven one day, but I'm also going to have to answer for what I do when I get to heaven one day. How did I live? How did I walk this life out? Did I steward everything that God gave me well? Because one day I'll be standing for God Almighty and he will judge me. He will judge you. You see, what you do really does matter. But when, if you believe in the Lord, you will be saved. Let me make that very clear. If you believe in the Lord, you will be saved. If you've given your life to Jesus, you will get to heaven. But what you do does matter. So when we open the word of God, it is one day going to judge us. No matter if you're a believer or unbeliever, we will one day be judged. So if we're going to be judged by the word one day, how much more should we just have a reverence, have an awe, and tremble at the word of God. For it's the word of God that will, ju- that will be your judge. Every time we open this word, we are looking at the thing which will one day judge us. We must come to a place with the word of God where we revere it, where we tremble before it. And so our prayer life won't be effective until we've, effective until we've learned to have a reverence towards his word. So we must be confident in his word. We must what? Take hold of his word. So point number three this morning, we must take hold of the, God's word. We must take hold of God's word. Just like Moses' rod turned to a snake and then Moses picked it up by the tail and took a hold of it, we must take hold of God's word. And some of you in this room, we all go through seasons of doubt. In those seasons of doubt, what do we do? We take a hold of the word of God. If you're doubting God in any kind of way, what do you do? If you're doubting the the healing power of God, if you're doubting God cares for you, if you're doubting God's forgiven you, if if you're doubting God loves you, if you're doubting he will bring that loved one to Jesus, I'm telling you, if you're doubting, just take a hold of the word of God. And oftentimes what we're doing is we're, we're letting pride get in the way of us completely submitting to him. And let me tell you something. We can't have authority until we've surrendered to authority. We can't walk in the authority that God's given us until we've fully submitted over our authority to him. We have to lay down our pride and lay down our life. And some of us are allowing pride to hold us back and it's manifesting itself in our life in a timid and shy way of how we walk out our faith. And so we must walk boldly because we have the word of God that's a lamp into our feet and a light into our path that we know what the word of God says and we can walk in what the word of God says. The thing is, Moses struggled with this exact same thing. I struggle with this exact same thing. I imagine that you might struggle as well. Let's read this, Exodus chapter 4, 10 through 17. It says this, Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be your mouth, and teach you what you shall say. Have you ever felt like me before and felt inadequate? Have you ever felt before, Lord, I know you're calling me into this thing, but God, I don't know if I can do it. Lord, I don't know if I can really accomplish, God, what you're laying out before me. What does God say to Moses? I know you might be feeling inadequate right now, but don't worry, Moses. I'm going to be your mouthpiece. I believe in this room right now, God is speaking that same thing to you. That don't worry. I know I've called you something big, but that's the whole point of surrender. You can't can't walk into authority until you surrender to authority. (laughs) 
that God's called you to do something big and something great, but you got to do it fully surrendering to him. And so that thing that you're lacking, that thing that you're nervous about, maybe God's given that to you so you don't think you're so big and mighty. I struggle with that too, y'all. Full surrender and full submission to the Lord. Let's read on. But he said, oh my Lord, please sin by my hand of whoever else you may sin. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses and he said, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well and look, he is also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words of his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people and he shall himself be a mouth for you and you shall be to him as God and you shall take this rod in your hand which you shall do the signs. What is our rod? Moses had a rod to do signs for the glory of God. What is our rod? Our rod is the word of God. We can defeat every attack of the enemy through the word of God as we partner with the spirit of God that lives within us. And we begin to declare the word of God boldly. We will see God do great and mighty things in this house, in our lives, and in our midst. Amen. The most effective way to release the authority God that God has given us into a situation is declaring through faith and under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and declaring the word of God and letting it be released. You see, this is a year of authority. Come on, church. This is the year of us walking in the authority that God has given you. This is a year of walking into the spiritual authority that God has given you as we marry the Spirit and the Word. We bring them together. Not all Spirit, not all Word, but the Spirit and the Word to walk in the spiritual authority that God has given you. Would you rise with me over this place? This is what we're going to do this morning. We're going, to, we're going to sing one song, and we're going to come up, and we're going to practice this morning having the Spirit and the Word come together, and we're going to declare over situations, different situations in our life, using Scripture. I'm going to show you how to operate this, and we're going to do it practically speaking. But what I believe, and I said this last week, is, and I've, I've said this a, a lot in my ministry, that worship creates an atmosphere where faith can be fueled. And faith creates an atmosphere of expectancy where miracles can happen. So what we're doing is we're allowing the worship to allow the Spirit of God to come because the worship invites the Spirit of God. So we're going to partner with that. And then we're going to declare Scripture over this place and see God move in the situations. Listen, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So just as someone was healed last week from cancer through prayer, I believe this morning that someone is going to be healed from cancer through prayer. Just as we talked about last week of how God moved in my sister's life to get rid of, can- uh, to get rid of that mass uh, and, and, and to heal her pregnancy, uh, but I'm believing today that God is going to do the exact same thing. Amen. So let's worship. Let's begin to sing right now, and we're going to walk this thing out. So Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're going to do. God, we thank you, Lord God, that, Lord, we can walk boldly in the word of God. Lord, you've given us a rod, and so, God, we extend the rod, God, and we will see, God, you move mightily when we learn to pray, God, with the Spirit, and also pray with the word. And so, God, we thank you for your presence in this place. In Jesus' name, come on, let's worship God.